Take your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading to 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you would please, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we'd like to read verses 17, then I'll read verse 18, and then we'll finish reading verse 19 together. Verses 17, 18, and 19. Verse 17 together, I'll read 18, and then join me again on verse 19 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word. And let's begin on verse 17 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Ready? Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Let's pray together. Father, we ask your blessing upon the reading of our scripture here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the good music this evening. It's it's always enjoyable to sing the songs that are associated with Christmas time, to enjoy the carols, Lord. Not only do we get get to hear them here at church, but uh, out in the world and in the malls and in the stores, uh, it's wonderful to hear songs about the Savior's birth. And Father, we're praying now that you will prepare our hearts with uh, the special yet lord that we'll listen carefully to the words of this song and that you'll tune our heart into your heart lord that each of us will be ready to listen and to hear what the spirit would say to each of us this evening and so lord control the special to that end lord in jesus name i ask it amen Stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt his wound. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn.
Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is a brother, and in his name all oppressions shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we, let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. Father, we bow before you in prayer now and we're asking for your help tonight as we open up your word and look at it together. I pray, Lord, that there'll be some things here this evening that will help all of us and that each of us will listen carefully to what you would want to say to each of our hearts. And Father, use the word of God in each one of our lives tonight now to accomplish your will in each of our lives and help us to leave in a little bit saying it sure was good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Lord, minister to us now as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanted to, I said I wanted to talk to you tonight. Is this, is this right? It doesn't sound right. An elderly, I, I want to teach you about how to have an enjoyable Christmas. Um, I was reading about an elderly widow who decided it was too much trouble to try to shop for all the kids and the grandkids. So she decided that she'd just send a check with their Christmas card and they could buy their own gifts. And so she filled the card out and she mailed the cards out. After a few days after mailing the cards, though, she remembered or she finally discovered that she mailed the cards out and forgot to put the check in the card. I know none of you have ever done that. But imagine the grandkids, though, when they open up the card with card from grandma that said Merry Christmas and it said buy your own gifts <laughs> there's no check in there <laughs> I guess it takes a little I guess it's good to take time to make sure you're prepared and I want to I want you to be prepared for Christmas I want you to you know it can be such a busy time with baking and gift wrapping and shopping and family get-togethers and there's a lot of times people don't enjoy Christmas very much. It's a hectic time, a busy time, and they're kind of uh, look forward to when it's all over. It becomes more of a, a bother than a blessing and certainly more of a headache than a hallelujah. And so, if your Bible's still open to 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'm not going to, uh, usually I would explain verses and such, but I'm going to do it a little differently tonight. I I want to look at a phrase from 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 17 that I think we don't want to miss, especially when it comes to, to this season of the year. Verse number 17, I want you to notice the last phrase of that verse. It's, it's, it's God who giveth us richly all things to what, church? Enjoy. All things to what? Enjoy. God giveth us richly all things to to enjoy. I, I would imagine he would include Christmas in that. And I would imagine he would include every day of our lives like that. And so God has given us these things to enjoy. So how can I enjoy Christmas? 
just going to give you three thoughts this evening, all right? And uh, they each take an hour and a half to explain, but I'm going to give you three thoughts. No, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, but I will give you three. The first one, I want you to go to Luke chapter 18. Would you please? Luke chapter 18. Notice with me in Luke 18, verse 15, would you please? Luke 18 and verse 15. And they brought unto him, that's Jesus, they brought unto him infants who would, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come to me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. And verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And it goes into another story. But I want us to notice that the first advice I'd give you to help you enjoy Christmas is what Jesus did here with these children, and that is become a child again. Become a child again. After some last-minute Christmas shopping with her grandchildren, Grandma was rushing them into the car when her four-year-old Jason said, Grandma, Susie has something in her pocket. He reached in and pulled out a brand-new red hair bar barrette that the, goes in a girl's hair. Grandma marched Susie right back into the store and made her put the item back where she found it. As they were walking out, the checkout clerk said, Have you kids been good so Santa will bring you presents? And the four-year-old Jason said, Well, I've been good, but my sister just robbed a store. <laughs> That's kids. You ever hear people say Christmas is for kids? When they say that sometimes, you wonder, have they gotten too old to enjoy it? Are they still thinking maybe about memories or disappointments that they had as a child when they celebrated Christmas. Jesus here wanted the little children to come to him. In fact, if you recall when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, he told Nicodemus that you must be born again. He said, yeah, Nicodemus couldn't comprehend that. Remember, he was the one who said, are you telling me i got to go a second time into my mother's womb and be born? And, of course, Jesus didn't mean that. He said, Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's talking about a spiritual birth. That's why he said that which, uh, it was a water birth, and physical birth is a water birth, but this is a spiritual birth. And he told Nicodemus, you have to be born again. In fact, if you look in John chapter 3, and you don't have to turn there, but he but he told Nicodemus that, again, it's just like beginning over. And I'm thinking of 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, where it says, Desire the sincere milk of the word as, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. So God likens us when we get saved to starting over, doesn't he? Starting over is babies. The day you accept, you, if you're born again tonight, if you have a time when you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have two birthdays. You have a physical birthday when you were born physically, but you also have a spiritual birthday when you were born again spiritually. All right? And when that happens, you start over again. Okay? And uh, some of you would like that probably, but you, you start all over again and uh, at a brand new age, and you become just like a little child. And, and when, when I say become a child again, what I, there's a difference between being a child again and being childlike and being childish, okay? I'm not talking about being childish. I'm not, children aren't always little angels. And, uh, and Jesus isn't saying that you shouldn't mature or you shouldn't grow up, okay? And we know that's not the, that's not the issue. Uh, that's a problem with too many adults. They haven't grown up yet, but they, uh, they haven't outgrown childish things like temper tantrums or selfishness and unforgiveness and things along those lines. But here's the things. We, we lay aside some things as we grow up. But there's a couple things I think you ought not to lay aside as you grow up. We mentioned one of them this morning a little bit in our talk about the Everlasting Father. 
But one of them is dependence. Don't be a child and become a child again in dependence. You know what children need? Children need somebody to take care of them. Children need somebody to meet their needs. Oh, they can do some things for themselves, but they need adults to take care of some things for them that they cannot do themselves. And most kids don't mind that arrangement. They don't mind the fact that there's a meal ready for them when it's mealtime. That's okay with them. They don't mind that there's clothes to put on when it's time to get dressed. And mom and dad, you, you take care of that. You make sure you buy clothes for me. That's okay. We're good on that. And, and by the way, parents don't mind that. Parents don't mind getting your children food and clothing and shelter and getting them to and from school or different activities that they may need to, to be in. And, and, and parents want to do that. And children trust their parents to do that very thing. But you understand, that's a model for us because we're God's children. And so we understand just as children, our physical children, rely on us, we, as God's children, are to be dependent on Him to take care of us. Don't, don't think you outgrow your need that you don't need God to take care of you. Okay, that, That's never the case. We always need God. We always need Him to care for us. Matthew 7, Jesus said this, What man is there among you, <clears throat> if, a, if his son asks bread, is he going to give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a, a, a... In fact, look at Matthew 9. Let's just read it together, okay? Matthew 9. It's good, good for us to look at it from the Scripture. Matthew 7, I'm sorry, and we're going to read verses 9 through 11. Matthew 7, 9 through 11. He said, if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? In verse 10. So he's saying, by the way, if his son asks bread, you're going to give him a stone? If Mark comes to Mike and says, uh, Dad, I'd like some bread. And Mike picks up a rock and gives it to him. Mark's going to say, uh, Dad, you okay? <laughs> Something wrong with you? Hmm? Someone said, you know, here, Jesus made, remember it? Well, I won't go there. Let's just go this. Will he give him a stone? And then notice, if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? Well, of course not. If he asks a fish, what are you going to give him? A fish. If he, asks, if he asks for bread, what are you going to give him? Bread. Okay, now look at verse 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So why is it we think we ask God for something good, He doesn't want to give it to us? But He's reluctant to give it to us. No, He'd love to give it to us. There are, there are things, you understand, there are things that maybe your children, if you ask them for a list of what they wanted at Christmas, they might have given you a list, and there may be some things on the list saying, well, we're not going to be able to do that this year. We're not going to be able to get this one this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're limited in your resources. You understand, God doesn't have that problem. God never looks and says, I'm a little short this month. Okay? God always has unlimited resources. And so he's waiting for us to ask. Why don't we have? We have not because we, we ask not. We don't depend on him. Somebody says, you know, when you get in a hard spot, we try to figure it out. We try to write it down. We try to talk to other people. We do everything we have to. And then you say, well, I guess, I guess we'll have to pray. Like, like that's our last resort. <laughs> No, it ought to be the first resort. God is our Heavenly Father. And God says that children rely or they depend on their parents. Not, not depending on Him to take care of us. And that's what children do. Children just rely on mom and dad. Okay? So, dependence. But the second thing that you can hold on to, even as you grow up, as an adult, but you can maintain a child likeness, is the wonder of everything. Children see the world differently. They're amazed at small things. They're amazed when they, when they see a falling star or a caterpillar <laughs> on the sidewalk. They see, uh, you know, they'll hear the story. Uh, Drew, for a long time, was really into David and Goliath. And uh, there was a video, I think, that he watched of Davy and Goliath and watched and watched and watched and watched. You ever been there? 
And where you say, man, don't you get tired of seeing that thing over and over again? No, you have a wonder about it all. How many of you read stories to your children or your grandchildren? And when, they, when you say, want me to read you a story, what do they do? They pick the same one. They want to hear that one again. They just about have memorized. But it's, it's amazing. Daniel in the lion's den or David and Goliath or Jesus walking on the water. They're just, they're just amazed. Don't lose the ability to wonder and uh, to, to, to have some amazement still in your life. Don't, you know, like Moses who, who he saw the bush on fire but he stopped to look. He, didn't, he stopped to admire that. He stopped to, to think on that because there's a bush on fire. I, I'm, I'm told that in the desert and that part of the world, and that would not necessarily be an unusual thing. It would, bushes catch fire, burn it, but they consume. This one didn't consume. It just kept burning. And Moses stopped to wonder about that and to ponder on it, if you will. And so don't. Don't miss some things that God may intend for you to ponder and to think about and to, to wonder and to have some amazement about. It ought to amaze us when we think about a virgin birth. Say, how does, how does that work? It doesn't work. We just believe that. That's an amazing thing, that God, what God did and how he sent the baby Jesus down to Joseph and Mary. Not people of high estate, people of low estate. People who weren't, weren't, uh, weren't in the upper crust of society. If we ever, someone said, if we ever stop wondering, we start wandering. An O and an A. And, and we start wandering away. So don't, don't lose the amazement. I remember, I remember sitting in, in churches. I remember... Uh, sitting in, in some pastor schools, and Brother Dave's been in some. I remember sitting there looking around and, and just saying, Lord, let me take this in. When you know, they have it at the Civic Center in, in Hammond, Indiana there, and because the church was under construction, and the place was packed out, and B.R. Lakin was speaking. And, man, I mean, people were everywhere, and chairs were, and people sitting on the floor. It was, uh, I'm sure the fire marshal was not aware of how many people were in there, and uh, and, and listening and preaching, I'm just looking around and hearing the singing and then sitting there listening to B.R. Lake. And I said, Lord, don't let me forget this. Because the day will come when we won't have these anymore. And I want to remember this. And I, I, wanna, I don't want to lose the wonder of it all. And the, remember when you got saved? When you first came to know Christ? How exciting the Bible was? I was just a young boy, and I started in Genesis, and man, I thought, this is the, this is, this is the greatest book I ever read. And, it, and, and by the way, I'm older than six now, and it's still the greatest book I've ever read. Have you lost the wonder of the Bible? Have you lost being amazed at God's Word, that God would communicate with us, and he'd write it in the pages of a book, and let us have copies of it? When, when 7 billion people in the world and over 3 billion people don't have a Bible? 3 billion, almost half the world's population could gather together and they don't have a Bible they can open and read the words of God? By the way, shame on us for not wanting them to get the Bible. It's kind of like, well, we got ours. Too bad for you. Huh? Oh, that shouldn't be our attitude. Amen? Don't get quiet on me now, all right? The wonder of it all. Become a child again. Not, not, not childish, but childlike. Depending on God. Not worrying about every little thing that goes on. Children don't worry about that. Children just show up. And you know, whatever happens, happens. And you know, while, while you may have it all planned out, what's, how your Christmas Eve is going to go and how your Christmas Day is going to go, God may have other plans. And, you know, if, if you have other plans, we do whatever the parent wants. We just follow his plan. And don't get too upset or worried about it. Become a child again. Great way to, to enjoy Christmas. The second thing is this, Acts 20. <clears throat> second piece of advice is Acts 20. This is the Apostle Paul saying goodbye to the elders at Ephesus. In Acts 20, and he says in verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, 
and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I wonder how many people think Christmas just won't be Christmas without presents. Is Christmas all about receiving gifts? Not supposed to. If you want to enjoy Christmas, Jesus said, you ought to rediscover the joy of giving. That's interesting. Paul says this. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And you say, well, let's see. Let's look up in the Gospels where Jesus said that. And guess what? <laughs> you won't find it. I don't know when Jesus said this to Paul, but at some point in their relationship, he said that to Paul, and Paul penned it down for us here in Acts 20 and verse 35. Quotes the words of Jesus himself. Giving brings more blessing than receiving. That's what Jesus taught. And we're not, no, we're not so sure about that. Because our culture in America is more into, into receiving than it is the giving. Kids, it, you never, no one ever said to their kids, okay, kids, let's sit down and make a list up of everything you want to give for Christmas. No, no, no. Let's make a list of what we want to get for Christmas. Isn't that how it works? Instead of sitting down saying, what would you like to give for Christmas? You go to any of the stores around here, Walmart, and of course now with Amazon and all the online shopping, thousands and millions of dollars are spent on presents for ourselves and our families. People walk out of Walmart and have two cartfuls and, you know, brimming over the top, and you know what they do? Somebody there with the Salvation Army kettle reach in their pocket for some change and throw some change in the kettle. We just checked out with $700 worth of Christmas stuff. And we threw 70 cents for others. But it's more blessed to give than to receive. Boy, it's quiet in here now. Now nobody enjoys Christmas, right? You know, we, we get to where we, I'll buy presents for somebody, but they better buy me one too. You know, I mean, I, I spent $20 on their present and they gave me something from the Dollar Tree. What's up with that? You see? We don't give, somebody said we don't give gifts, we exchange gifts. Honestly, often most of us feel just the opposite of Jesus' words. Is it more blessed to give than to receive? I'm not saying it's wrong to receive a present or, or receive a gift or buy gifts for anyone. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But let's remember that it is more blessed to give. That the pleasure of giving to someone should, should far exceed the pleasure of receiving something. That's what you have to keep in mind. I mean, think about, think about how many times you got excited. You know, you unwrapped a gift. It was wonderful. It was great. Or your children, you give them something they really wanted. And boy, they're all excited. They're jumping up and down. And two months later... They can't even find it or it's in the bottom of the toy box or the dog chewed it and it's in the trash anyway. When they're young, they, they'll, they'll get the toy you got them, they'll put it to the side and they'll play with the box you put it in anyway. I often think when they're little like that, just wrap a box up. <laughs> Let them have it. But when you give a toy or you give a gift to a, to a child who has no parents or you bring food to somebody or give some money to feed somebody who otherwise might go hungry. Maybe when you take time to give something to somebody who maybe everybody else has forgotten about and doesn't think about. That's a blessing beyond anything you could ever receive when you take time to give. Give to others. God so loved the world, He gave. You're never more like God than when you give. 
give. There's more blessed to give than it is to receive. When we give, we're doing what God did. He gave His only begotten Son. So the real joy comes from giving. The real joy comes from becoming childlike again. The third thing I want to share with you is in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, and notice with me verse 14. Verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Oh man, that's a great verse, isn't it? Huh? I guess we'll just move right on past that one. And might be a good one to keep around though, you know that? Verse 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And so I just, I put for this, that what else can you do? You can turn the lights on. I know. I'm not saying the lights on in nobody's home, okay? I'm saying turn the lights on. One of the great things you like at Christmas is the lights. The zoo up there has what? Two million? Two million of them? Brother Bob was telling me a place over in Dayton has three million. Everybody wants to top the other guy, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and people drive. People drive for miles to look at the Christmas lights and to, to be in awe and admire them. You, I like the guy whose neighbor went all out and decked it all out with the music and the synchronized with the lights and all that, you know what I mean, and all the things in his yard. And, and I like that sign I saw he put in his yard. He just put ditto and put an arrow pointing over to his neighbor. <laughs> That's my guy right there. And, uh, but, you know, Jesus, Jesus said he was the light of the world. He is the light of the world, but he said we're to let our light shine in the world. So the world is a dark place. Darkness in the Bible always talks about no spiritual direction. That's where our world is. It lacks spiritual direction. And, and, and when it's in darkness, what you need is light. And so we're the light of the world. We're to shine our light. We're to make sure that this is the time of year that we'll live differently than the world does. We'll live differently than those who don't know Christ. They've got to see a difference in us. This is our time to show that. While everyone else might be griping and fussing, and they, we, ought to, we ought to show them we can be content and loving and caring and giving and thoughtful. If the people we work with live selfishly or carelessly without thinking about the Lord, how should we live? The Bible says here that it's worth to be blameless and harmless the sons of God, without rebuke. We're supposed to be shining. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. They'll see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is, hey, it's always our time to shine. Okay? Not, not shine on us. To shine on Him. And keep the light on, on the Lord the way it ought to be. And there's no better time to do that than Christmas time. Most people... I know they, they, there's some connection in their head that Christmas has to do with Jesus' birth. The other day somebody said, oh, these, these uh, uh, Christian people always trying to, trying to cram religion into the holiday. It's the birth of Jesus, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is about Him. And they, wanna, they think we're kind of crowding out all the other stuff. It's quite the other way around. But they don't think that Jesus' birth had anything to do with how they live or how they'll die. He was just that baby in the manger. And, and they have to understand there's, there was a whole lot more to Jesus' life than him just being born in a manger. And, and they have to see that by us shining and letting our light shine before men. Jesus came in Bethlehem, but he came to be born. As we sang tonight, he came to be born to die. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, I've come to give my life a ransom for many. Jesus came and He was born. And He lived a perfect, sinless life. 
So that 33 years later, he would go to a cross and he hang there and he bleed and he die. It's only the wages of sin that are death. Jesus had no sins. He would not have to make the wages of sin. But he paid those wages because they weren't his sins he was paying for. He was paying for our sins. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But don't put us in that verse. Put your name in that verse. Danny would say, God commended His love toward Danny and that while Danny Wright was yet a sinner, Christ died for Danny Wright. Lawrence Bowman would say, but God commended His love towards Lawrence Bowman and that while Lawrence Bowman was yet a sinner, Christ died for Lawrence Bowman. But you know the great news is you can put your name in there because Jesus Christ died for you. Don't just think, well, yeah, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Yes, He did. But there's people who are suffering in eternal flames of hell this evening who believe Jesus died for the sins of the world. That's just believing a fact of history. Salvation is when you believe He died for my sin. He took my place. He died for me. And you put your faith in what He's done for you. Salvation is not spelled do, D-O. Salvation is spelled done, D-O-N-E. It's nothing we do. It's what Jesus has done for us when He died on the cross. It's our time to tell that story. Ask for opportunities to share that. We got to go up yesterday and see my mom, who at 92 is finally decided she wants to probably have some, she, she still wants to be independent in her living, but not all by herself in a home. And uh, my one sister and them have rented her a home for a while. And so she's going to go into an assisted living situation. And we went to look at the place they were considering for her to live in. It's a very nice place, but there's other people then. She can just, you know, you walk out and all your meals are taken care of and there's it's a beautiful place. It's uh, just, just really a nice arrangement. But after that, we saw that, we went out to uh, eat lunch at Texas Roadhouse. And um, while we're sitting there talking and uh, coming down the tables, making visits at the tables with Santa Claus. Okay? And I was waiting for him to get to our table. <laughs> hmm? and, and as he gave out candy canes, you know, <laughs> touched the table, I took the track out of my pocket. I said, Santa, I said, when you die, you're not going to go to the North Pole. <laughs> I, you, you try your approach, I'll try mine, okay? But, <laughs> and I said, this, this track right here, those, these Bible verses will tell you how you can know you're going to heaven when you die. That's the most important thing you'll ever know. And he thanked me. And he took it. And and at least Santa got the gospel, okay? Just so you know. And, by the way, it's a... He's coming now. The Santa train has arrived. I won't tell him whose phone it was, Harvey. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Prepare your heart. Be ready. There's opportunities all the time. You never know who God's wearing in their heart. Here's, here's uh, Rick here tonight. Because this afternoon somebody just said, here's a track. Would you come to church tonight? And here he is. You never know. True story. Two weeks before Christmas, a nine-year-old girl was walking with her friend down the street, sliding on the ice. The two of them were talking about what they hoped they'd get for Christmas. They stopped to talk to an old man named Harry who was on his knees pulling weeds around a large oak tree. He wore a frayed wool jacket, a pair of worn garden gloves, his fingers were sticking out the ends, a little bit blue from the cold. 
Harry responded to the girls and he told them he was getting the yard in shape as a Christmas present to his mother who had passed away several years before. His eyes brimmed with tears as he patted the old oak. My mother was all I had. And she loved her yard and her trees. And so I do this for her every Christmas. His words touched the girls and soon they were down on their hands and knees helping him pull the weeds. The three of them took the rest of the day and completed the task. When they finished, Harry pressed a quarter into each of their hands. I wish I could pay you more, but that's all I have right now. The girls often passed that way before, and as they walked on, they remembered that the house was shabby. There was no wreath and no Christmas tree or any other decorations on the house. Just the lonely figure of Harry sitting by the curtainless window. The quarters seemed to burn a hole of guilt into the girls' minds as they returned to their homes. The next day, one of the girls called her friends and they agreed to put their quarters in a jar marked Harry's Christmas present. And they began to seek out small jobs to earn more and every nickel, dime, and quarter they earned went into that jar. Two days before Christmas, they had enough money to buy new gloves and a Christmas card. Christmas Eve found him on Harry's doorstep singing Christmas carols. When he opened the door, they presented him with gloves wrapped in pretty paper, the card, and a pumpkin pie still warm from the oven. With trembling hands, he tore the paper from the gloves, and then to their astonishment, he held them to his face and wept. You know, you can survive Christmas if you want. Complain. Yawn when you hear the Christmas story. Be glad when it's all over. Or you can enjoy Christmas like those girls did in that story. Become a child again. Rediscover the blessing of giving. And let your light shine, that others will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And you'll have an enjoyable Christmas, guarantee it. Let's pray. Father, take the truth this evening. Thank you for the scriptural principles we look at tonight to help us to enjoy. You said you've given us all things richly to enjoy. And we ought to enjoy each holiday season. We ought to enjoy every season of life. We ought to enjoy each day that you give to us. Maybe that's why you called it a, the present. And I pray, God, that you would help each of us to be childlike, to depend on you, to be aware of what's going on around us, and always have an aware, a, a wonder, an amazement of what you do for us. I pray, Lord, that we'll know the joy of giving more than receiving. And God, that we will let our light shine. We will take every opportunity to tell someone about the Savior. It wasn't just a babe in a manger. But unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I pray you've spoken to our hearts tonight.